click start recording. So yeah, let's go back to where we were. I'm going to need this open in a second. I'll get there. But we were talking about files, how to read from files, how to do cool file-like stuff. Let's keep going there. Let's finish up those slides, and that'll be it for the day. I'll get on this in a second once we need to get there. But yeah, let's finish these, up, these slides up here. So we ended here talking about just a combination of our OF streams and our IF streams. Uh, I think I just have some fun examples for, for us today, and that should do it. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Key idea, first thing I want to tell you is IF streams, when you're reading a file, input file stream, they're kind of like Microsoft Word in a sense. They're like Google Docs or whatever you use to, to edit like an essay or something. In the sense that if you have a file open inside of an IF stream, it essentially starts its little cursor right here. It's ready to read from the start of the file. Okay, so there's a little tiny cursor. It's working like that. And that's what happens when you say IF stream IFS and you make it point to that file. You have it started the file. It sets this little cursor, like Microsoft Word, at the very beginning. And so uh, then you can start reading from IFS, just as if it were CN, and it would move that cursor. It'd be like, all right, the cursor was here. I just read a word, so I'm going to move the cursor past that word. So the next time you read from me, I'm going to read the next word. Does that make sense? That's what it's doing secretly. It's got this little cursor. And so I read one word. I read another word. Now the cursor's here. I read one more word. I just read baz into the string s. And so now the cursor's here because I'm done with it. The next thing that I want to read is after that. Yeah. And it, all, it skips over white, white space and all that fun stuff when you read like that. But that... That's essentially the idea, okay? So, yeah, that's a fun fact. And then if you read the last words, like the, the IF stream, the cursor's sitting right here. It's like, I read that last word. I have not yet reached the end of the file. You try to read one more time, though, I will read past the end of the file and alert you that that read did not succeed, okay? That's the idea. So, uh, yeah. Does that make enough sense? Just think of the cursor and... In Microsoft Word, that's essentially what's going on there. Okay, so that's that. Let me next show you uh, an error. So let's let's have an example of accidentally reading after a file is over with. Okay, so let's check for EOF, and then we'll read a word if it's false, something like that. Uh, this could be your strategy if you would like to use that strategy, but it's going to be unfortunately not the right one. You check EOF a little too early if you do it this way. So let me show you an example with a file, and uh, hopefully it will make sense. And then I'll explain the rest of these words here. So let's go here. Where are we? We're lecture 20. So yeah, here vim eof.cpp. So let's uh, let's make a program that reads a file. Oh no, that's the beauty of Zoom. It pops up when I don't want it to hide. Oh, it's because escape. If I press escape, it brings it back into view. Oh, that sucks. Okay. Uh, well, we'll just deal with it. I hope this helps. Let me know if it doesn't, because then I can definitely get rid of it. So, uh, F stream. And let's make an IF stream object that's going to read from a file, IFS, have it read from a sample file.txt. And then let's, let's assume that that file had, I think it's just, I wanted to put exactly what I had on that slide in, yeah? Yes. Confirmed. So here is the file that I would like to have, sample-file.txt, just these four lines. So let's make that file before I forget about it. Sample-file.txt. And then we'll paste. Of course we won't. Then we'll paste in these four lines. 
So there's four lines in the file, four words in the file. And then let's read all of them one at a time. IFS, read an S. Read an S, read an S, read an S. So I've just read those four words into the string S, overwriting it each time. But that's going to move that cursor, right? That cursor is sitting right here at the end of the file right now. And now let's print, let's print, hey, IFS, are you at the end of the file? It just read all those four words. Surely it is, right? Hmm. Let's see. It is not. It read all the words. Its cursor is sitting right here. There is nothing here, but it has not noticed that it's reached the end of the file yet. Because... It's just ready to read the next character. If there is one, it hasn't tried. You have to try for it to notice that you're at the end of the file. Okay? That's the idea. So that would be a little too soon checking for you. Because if you read, watch what happens. If I read IFS into S once more, I can see out IFS.UF. This notices the end of the file. And the read fails. So watch what happens. So see out ifs.eof. It should print one. Now, yeah, it's true. But what's an S? What in the world is an S right now? Because this line read nothing, right? There was nothing left in the file to read. What did it put into S? What are our options, right? So we got blah was the last character that was read into S, and then we read another, or the last string. Then we read one more string that was after that. Maybe it's empty now. Maybe S has been set to the empty string. But no, it's still set to blah. This line does nothing at all. It just notices the end of the file. If there's nothing to read, if there's an error upon reading, like there is, then it's not going to touch that variable S. It's whatever it used to be. So you might accidentally think that your file has a second copy of the last line if you read like this, if you check EOF too late, okay? Does that make sense? Any questions about that? So yeah, that's, that's what I was trying to say there. When you try to read and you read past the end of the file, your variable that you thought was gonna hold something else, because it's like, we're not at EOF yet, surely there's something more to read, you thought it was gonna get new data, but it didn't. It didn't get changed at all. You got a copy of the last thing because that line didn't, it didn't do anything. It just noticed the end of the file. Okay? So yeah, just be careful. Don't use that variable if you just read past the end of the file. You better check after the read. After the read, did it succeed? Because only then, after the read, does it notice it was at the end of the file. Any questions about that? That is the key. All right. So yeah, uh, just some fun examples for us today uh, involving images towards the end, so that'll be fun. So let me copy in a lot of sample files that I'm going to be using today. Give me a second for that. Copy. Uh, can I? 40. Much 20. So we have... The lyrics to Let It Go, first of all, we're going to copy those into today's folder. We're going to copy a large list of Swedish words into the today's folder, and I believe that's it. Okay, cool. So let's work on Let It Go first. So here's my first silly example. Let's uh, translate, partially, I don't know, the lyrics to the hit song Let It Go from Frozen. Okay, so let's do that. And so the idea is I would like to read in the entire lyrics file. Um, I don't know. Let it go dot let it go lyrics dot text. Here they all are. And I'd like to translate some of the words. Like I'm pretending to be Google Translate or something. So like I know we can translate snow to Spanish and so it will print out the Nieve glows white on the mountain tonight or something like that. And then we can pick some more words to translate. Okay. So that is the goal, and we'll just read through the file, spitting back out the words after we've translated them, okay? Uh, we will eventually need to worry about white space, and I'll show you the problem uh, after I get it started, okay? So, uh, yeah, here's the, the layout of this program, translate.cpp. 
I'd like some audience participation for this one. Tell me what languages you speak and we'll use those to translate. Stream. I need F stream. And I need, uh, I'm eventually going to need CC type. So I need to notice white space or is space. But I won't use it just yet. So here's what I want to do. I want to read in the lyrics of that that file, right? I have stream ifs read in let it go lyrics.txt. And then uh, I want to read in a word at a time. I'd like to read in a, a word at a time uh, into this file and have it work. So remember the strategy for reading in a word at a time to like figure out when you're done, what, what I was showing last time or what I gave you in a lab. It's like while ifs can get a string and it gives back itself and it was okay. This is the kind of strategy I'd like to use to read a, a string at a time, read a word at a time out of this file. So I use this kind of looping because this evaluates, reads the string and then it evaluates to IFS if it's true, it was a successful read and so we hit the body, it's just beautiful. Okay, so that's what I'm gonna do. And that's what I'm gonna do there. Uh, let's see here. So yeah, let's try it this way. So let's say, string word. I'm going to read a word every time. So while I can get a word out of IFS, then uh, let's translate that word. See how it translate. I'll make a translate function. Translate the word, please. And then, I don't know, a space. So we're just translating each word, spitting it back out. Let's pretend I don't know how to translate anything right now. String translate. It takes a string now, constant string, let's say, constant string reference s, and we want to translate this word into all the languages. And so let's pretend we don't know how to translate anything at all and just return s, okay? So this is a, a function, takes a word at a time, gives back a new word, potentially. This one's just giving back the same word right now. But this is how I am reading everything. So ifs.close, don't forget that. And that should be a complete, uh, a complete program for now. And so this program just read every string in the file as a word, and it just spat them back out. So snow goes white on the mountain tonight because this is the file, right? And it definitely doesn't look as pretty right now. That's no fun. So let's fix that first, okay? And then we'll do some translation. So uh, instead of translating a word, printing it back out, and then printing a space after it, let's retain whatever white space was after every word because that uh, read into a string line is only going to get non-white space characters. It's only going to get words. Sitting after them are some space characters maybe, maybe multiple, uh, some new lines. Sometimes it's a new line, right? Well, I would like to preserve those, okay? So here's the trick. And I did realize that I forgot to say something on this slide. Uh, the reason that it didn't notice that the file was over, like, here is the last word, here was its cursor, it had not yet read the end of the file. We can think of the end of the file as like a place in the file that needs to be read one last time. Don't forget that. Okay, so here is the trick if you would like to deal with white space. You use dot peak, ifs dot peak, and ifs dot git, all right? Those are on the, oh gosh, I hope I didn't just ruin the, there we go. Those are in IF stream, peek and git. They deal with individual characters. So git gets a single character and peek looks at the next character but does not advance the cursor. So that's going to be important, okay? So let's pretend this was the contents of my file and I was reading like the word blah and for some reason, this is exactly where my cursor was. I just read the B character. I'm about to read the L. Okay, so that's the idea. Uh, or let's start it from the beginning. Let's say I haven't read anything yet. Let's say the cursor is here. I am about to read the B. If I say ifs dot git, it gets a single character. That'll give me back the B, and it will also move that cursor. It just saw that character, so it will move the cursor to here, right before the L. That's what dot git does. It reads a single character advancing the little files cursor, okay? 
ifs.peak does something similar. ifs.peak right now, I've moved the cursor, remember, will also give back a character. It will give back the L, but it does not advance the cursor. It just looks ahead. It does not actually take the character out. So it, a subsequent call to get would give you back another L. It doesn't move the cursor. And that's perfect for us, because we want to look ahead and see, hey, is the next character in my little file that I want to print out, is it a space character? If so, I want to retain exactly what it was, because maybe it's a new line, maybe it's a couple new lines, I want to keep them all in there. Or maybe it was not a space character. If it's not a space character, I don't want to keep advancing, right? I want to wait for that new uh, call to get a word from this line to take over. Okay, I just want to deal with space characters, so I want to look ahead with peak to see if there's a space character there. If so, I'll output it, and I want to stop that kind of space character preservation once I reach a non-space character. Does that make enough sense? Any questions about that? So that's what I like to do now. So instead of outputting a space every time, I want to preserve whatever white space was after this word. So preserve all white space after this word. And so I want to continue. I want to output some characters. I want to output the next character, ifs.get, as long as that next character is white space. So let's peek ahead and see if it is. So if ifs.peek ahead, get the character, is that a space character? Is space ifs.peek. Does that make sense? So while the next character is white space, I would like to preserve that exact character. Maybe it was a tab, maybe it was a space, maybe it was a new line, okay? So while it's there, I know it's a white space character, let's uh, let's move the cursor, let's eat it up. That's the technical term, at least from my brain. So our next char, we're gonna get that character. Let's call get now, ifs.get. That's the new character that we just read and we've just moved the cursor now, so we won't read it again. And let's output that character. So output that white space character. And then we'll see on it. And this loop will continue as long as the next character is white space. If there's two new lines in a row, it'll look ahead, hey, there's one new line, let's move the cursor, output it, and let's move the cursor one more time and output it. But maybe the next time it's like, it's the next word, maybe it's say, and so it sees the S. It's like, okay, I'm done. I'm gonna go back, end of the loop, let's start all over, read the next word. Does it make sense why this is going to preserve the white space? So look ahead, see if there's white space, get that character, so advance the cursor, output the character. That should do it. Yay, and so here is the outputted final file. It's just the original file again. But it has all of the white space preserved. So the snow goes white on the mountain tonight. New line. There's a couple new lines after queen. New line, new line. Do we see how that's preserving the white space? That's important. And yeah, so it wouldn't be as fun if uh, it was just outputting the same file. You can do that yourself. Let's do something interesting, like translate some words. Let's pretend like, uh, I don't know, let's translate snow. I already picked that one. So if we see the string snow, if S is snow, then the output should be the Spanish version of that. And then if we don't know how to translate the character, we'll just return, the string will just return the same string. Okay, so now it's going to be like, okay, uh, oops, there we go. And I call translate on every word that I see. I'll put the translated word. So now every time they say snow, it gets output as nieve. The nieve glows white on the mountain tonight. Yay. Isn't that exciting? So we're preserving the white space and also changing the text. That's a very standard thing to want to do with file processing. Okay? What other languages do we speak in this class? What, what, what should we translate? Nouns are the easiest, that's for sure. Are we all just Spanish speakers? Which word should we take? I don't know. Let's go to Google Translate. One thing I, that would be fun that I want to show you is, I don't know, uh, 
let's go English to like Chinese or Japanese or something because it's the same character. Let's translate mountain. Look at one cool thing that you can do. Mountain. Montagne. Uh, let's just do Japanese. Yama. So you can actually put non Latin characters in a C++ file. Else if S is equal to mountain, then return that Chinese character for mountain. That's part of the file now. So now preserve the white space, the nieve goes white on the Yama tonight. Any questions about that? Oh, that's working, yes. Uh, I don't know about putty, honestly, but it was control shift V for me on this Windows terminal. That might be the same on putty. Yeah, so uh, that's my silly example. You haven't told me what languages you speak, so I'll just move on. All right. So, uh, first example, uh, new example, combined example, let's program the copy command. Copy is the CP command. I just used it to bring in some text files. Let's have it read one, uh, read a file one character at a time and output it to another file. So this is what the copy command does on the terminal. You say copy, you give one file name, you give the other file name, and it copies file one into file two. It copies file one, it calls it file two, okay? So let's program that command. It'll be very easy. We'll just read a character at a time from the file with git, and then there, there's the opposite of git. It's called put for an output file stream. You say put, put a single character, write a single character to that output stream. Okay, so we need one if stream to read from the original file and one of stream to write to the output file. Does that make sense? Let's do that. And we need it to use command line arguments as well. All right, so I'll just pull it up. I guess cp.cpp. So I need f stream. I need strings. I think that's it. I also need command line arguments. So int arg c char star arg v bracket bracket. Remember those. And so the first file, the file that we want to copy from, is the first argument. So that would be an argv1 string input file. File name is in argv1. And then argv2 is the output file name. All right, that's the idea. And then let's open an if stream to read from the input file. IFS, let's read from the input file name. And let's make an of stream to write to the output file name. So now they're hooked up together, they're ready to go, and let's read a character at a time. Read a character at a time from the input file and copy it using put into the output file. That's the opposite of git, it's put. And of course it takes the character that you want to write, while ifs.git gives back that character that it just read. All right, so forever, until I hit the end of the file, well, remember to do it properly this time, so I want to read a character from IFS, and I want to write that same character, or put, I don't know, put the character into OFS. So it's going to be char c, next char is ifs.git, and then we want to output ofs.put, that same character. So read a character, put it into the output file. So that'll preserve and copy it. Okay. The issue is we never stop. We need to stop when the file is over, when the input file is over. So we need to check for EOF, right? We need to do it the right way, though. We need to make sure that we just got something and it was valid. After every read, we should be checking, okay? Because that's when it could go wrong. After every read. So let's make sure after this read that it was still a correct character, right? Make sure we got a valid character before we write it because we might not have gotten one because we reached the end of the file. So if 
ifs.eof is true now. We just tried to get a character, but we couldn't. It would set eof to true, then break. Now we're done with the file. Okay? That will stop the loop at the right place. You could also say uh, if ifs, or if not ifs is true. That would also work. Because it would check, hey, are you good? Right? ifs would give back a Boolean saying, am I okay to be read from? Is everything fine? But no, everything should not be fine. It should be not true, right? So output a valid character after we get it. And then uh, once the loop is over, we've hit the end of the file, the input file. We have nothing left to write to the output file. And of course, we're done with the input file too, so let's close the bowl. There we go. So that is all at once the output. cp.cdp-ocp. So let's copy, I don't know, the sample file. Copy from sample file.txt into sample file copy.txt. And so it runs, and hopefully, here's the sample file.txt. Hopefully, the sample file copy looks exactly the same. And yes, it does. Perfect. Exact duplicate. Yeah, so we read a character at a time and wrote that character to the output file, making sure to stop once we were done with the input file. Any questions about that example? So yeah, we copied file one into file two, and uh, let's see. So we needed an if stream and an of stream, and the way we ran it was we said dot slash cp, that was the name of the program, and we gave the file one that we wanted to copy and the file two that we wanted to call the copy. And so remember what argv is going to be. This would be argv0, this would be argv1, this would be argv2. So this file name, this first file name, that's why we had to start at one, right? That was living in argv1. argv1, and this one was living in argv2. All right. Are we good with that? Yeah, I just have a bunch of fun little examples today. So the next thing that I want to teach you about is a type called string string. It is like your own personal C out or C in. It does both. So you can build up strings and you can also extract the stuff that you built up. It's like a little mini terminal that you can write and read from, or a little mini file, whatever you want to think about it as. So it lives in this header, s stream. So let's go there, s stream, and the type name is string stream. String stream. And I don't know, you can do some cool stuff. You can do insert, get back stuff, but, no oh gosh, yeah, that's not helpful now, is it? You can get back the string that you made. Uh, let's look at the constructor. Is there a nice example file? There it is, a so string stream SS. You can put stuff into it. You can get that stuff back out of it. Super fancy. So let me just show you a quick example of string streams. Let's see here. All the things to remember to say today. So if you want to make a string stream that's empty, you just say string stream. You give it a name like SS. And you can start building stuff inside of it. SS, once you declare it, it's, it's empty. It's not holding anything. It's a little empty string, essentially. It's got room to, be, uh, to have things in it, though. You can start pretending that it's a file or C in and C out, though, and it'll build up a string. So you can use the give it stuff, you can give it, and you can use the get stuff out as well. So I can say SS, give it 100, the number 100. And it will write 100 to the string stream. It's like a little mini file. Then I can write new line, ss, and del. Totally fine. That will now be ready to start typing on this line. I can say ss, give it 200 now. And that will build up the string this, 100, new line, 200. That's a just a fun way to build up a string if you would like to do it that way. Uh, and then also you can extract stuff. You can say int x, get that thing out of the string stream that I just put in. So it starts at the beginning. So if I say ss get out of it into x, it will start reading, its cursor starts here, it will read the 100 and put the 100 into x, which is crazy. 
It's like you're making a string and you're reading from it at the same time. That's pretty cool. And then also, if you ever want back the entire string that you built up inside of the string stream, you can say ss.stir, and that'll give back the string that you built up. So if it was 100, and then a new line, and then 200, this would be the string you get back. 100, new line, 200. So I hope you can kind of see, vaguely see, the, the use of this. But that is the idea. So let me just show you all this in code. String theme. And so you got to include s stream to get there. And let's make one string stream ss. And so now we have an empty string built up. Let's put a hundred into it, and then a new line, and then two hundred. So I've built up that string inside of it, and now I can extract it. Int x equals nothing right now. Let's get it out of ss. So if I see out x, it will now hold 100, because that's what I put first into the string stream. It's really cool. See out uh, and l. And then if you want the entire string that you built up, you can just say see out ss.stir. Okay? And then I'll do a new line after that, I guess. So that is the idea. Where is my... There it is. Yay, so here it's outputting the 100 that I got out and put into X, and then the entire string was 100, new line 200, and it prints it all out like you would expect. Not too bad. It's just useful to build up an entire string with a string stream, I would say, because you can give it numbers, you give it any type that can be printed, essentially, and it will put it all into a string for you. This actually used to be the way that you would convert a number to a string. That two string function used to not exist in C++. So yeah, that's string streams. Any questions about those? All right, because I have a fun example for you. I'll give you a while to do it, or maybe I'll give you a head start. But here's my silly project for you. I'll give you this file on like uh, Discord or something if you'd like to download it or I'll put it on the code from class, I'll give it to you right now. But here's the fun idea. You know how, uh, you guys have been to Ikea before, most likely? You know how they're, they're, uh, the names of their products are all just random Swedish words? Sometimes random com combinations of Swedish words? So I have made a, or I've extracted like, I made a file that is like the 100 most popular Swedish words, or thousand most popular Swedish words. And so if you take this file, you can generate essentially funny random Ikea names, okay? So here's how you can do that. You could read all the words from this file into a vector of strings, right? So you have a vector. So read that entire Swedish words file into a vector of strings. It's very long. Like, I don't know, A, B, C, whatever the words are. D. And then you can pick two random ones, pick two random places, like pick index one, pick index three using the rand function, picking the index, right, and going to that index. And that could be your random IKEA product name. Okay? Does that sound like a fun example? So yeah, read this file, pick out two random words, and output them right next to each other. So maybe you pick this word, and then this word, and you output them together, and that would sound like an IKEA product. Okay? Does that idea make sense? So I'll give you some time to try this, and then I'll do it with you as well, but let me give you this file really quick. So, um, Swedish words at TFT. So you can now obtain this file in the normal place that you get all your class stuff. Uh, so just go to any lecture, or go to the top of our canvas, and go to code from class, if you would like it. We kind of need it for this example, though. Code from class, CSI 40, and today's lecture. If it ever wants to load for me. There it goes. 
So there is today, 30 seconds ago, and here's the file. You can copy and paste it, click raw to get the whole thing and just immediately copy and paste it. But here's the file, make that somewhere, and then write a program that generates random IKEA names. Okay, so I'll give you like five minutes to start trying this. But yeah, pick two random indices, go there and print out the words. Like you pick D first and then B and you'll just output them right next to each other. And then DB is your, your random product name. So please help each other with that. And I will show you how I might do it in five minutes. Remember to seed your random number generator, by the way. Otherwise, it's going to output the same random IKEA product name.
take a few more seconds and I'll do it while you race to finish it before me. All right. So yeah. Were there any questions that came up while you were trying this? Does it make sense, the process? Maybe it just was taking a little while. So let me show you how I might do it. We'll call it ikea.cpp. So f streams. So I want to read a file. Uh, vectors. Because I want to make a vector of strings. Uh, strings. Because I want to put strings in the vector. Mm. C stood lib for random and C time for seed the random number generator. So s rand time zero. And now I'm ready. So let's make a vector of all the strings in the file. And what was it called? Was it capital? Yeah, it's capital Swedish words .txt. So let's make an if string. So there it is. And let's make a vector of all the words in that file. Vector, string, words, word, words. And we want to read every word in the file into the words vector. Okay, so string word, how do you read every word in the file? While IFS read in a single one. While that was successful, add that to my words vector. Words.pushback, that word that I just read. And so this will just read through every word in the file, put it in the vector, right? And then I'm done with the file, ifs.close. Now I just need to pick two random words, get two random words out of the vector. And it's a big long vector, right? I don't know, like, I don't know how big it is unless I use size, but I want some random indices, right? Go to some random indices because that will give me some random words. So I don't know. String word one is, well, I want to go into words at some index, at some random index. So at random, or sorry, rand. And then I want to make sure that it's always between zero and the size minus one, so I'll use mod. Mod the size of the vector, words.size. If I use mod words.size, that will always give me a value between zero and words.size minus one. That's perfect. That's exactly a valid index into my vector. So that's the first word, that's the second word. So go to that index and you've got a random word. So see out those words right next to each other. And that is the hot new IKEA product name. Does anybody else have the shark? I love my little shark. So yeah, I can actually keep most of this open, I think. But that's the that's the bulk of the program, and here it is running. It picked two words and it output them, two random Swedish words. I'm not even going to pretend to pronounce them, but that's probably, like, they could use that as a product name. They could use that as a product name. People would probably buy it. Isn't that beautiful? Some of these maybe are already existing ones. Who knows? So yeah, that's my silly little next example. Did we get that? Any questions about it? So I think I have just one more uh, for fun. And that should be the end of it. I would like to next talk about images. Because why not? Let's go as cool as possible. Uh, I would like to teach you how to change some images. Because why not? So what is an image but a file? that we can read and manipulate 
Woohoo! So like Photoshop, it's just reading files and writing files at the end of the day. Let's make our own filter for images. And so I'm going to use a very, very inefficient encoding of images. Most images these days are compressed. Those are hard to read, especially for a CSI 40 class. So I'm going to use a very silly encoding of an image. It's called a, a PPM image. I don't think it can even be read on Windows. So I'll be going over to my... Uh, What's it called? My virtual machine in just a second. But here is a image file. Here's the here's a PPM image file for an image with six pixels. Here it is. It looks like this. It says starts with P3. Then the size of the file is three by two, width and height, 255 to talk about like the maximum color value, and then it gives six pixels in order. So let me teach you how those are all encoded if you've never worked with colors before on a computer. Yay! So. I'm going to teach you some image theory. So every image that's being displayed on the projector that's in this picture that I copied and pasted, it's made up of a bunch of pixels, right? A bunch of square pixels. I'm sure you've taken a magnifying glass to a screen before, or at least you've just looked. If you zoom in far enough, everything is just a bunch of squares, right? Those are all pixels, and they're all single values, all single color values. Whee. That's the idea. So each color is usually represented in RGB color. So that is a, uh, not a pair, but a triple of numbers. It's three numbers at once. It's three numbers between 0 and 255. A triple of numbers representing how much red is in that color, how much green is in the color, and how much blue is in that color. Okay? And RGB is like light, it's additive, which means if you put maximum red, maximum green, ma maximum blue, so that's 255 for all of them, that gives you white, that's the color white, and then none of them, no red, no green, no blue, is pure black. Okay, that's the idea. And then uh, if you give, uh, the rest are just anything in between, some amount of red, some amount of green, some amount of blue, uh, if they all happen to be equal, like if red is equal to green is equal to blue, you can kind of extrapolate from this that it's going to be gray. It's going to be some shade of gray that's perfectly neutral. So like this is a dark shade of gray, this is a lighter shade of gray, if they're all equal. Okay? That's how colors work uh, in a nutshell. But yeah, the PPM image format is one way to store colors in uh, a computer. It's a file type that stores images it stores the RGB values as text, which is really not efficient, but it's good for us as we're learning, okay? So this is what a PPM image file looks like. It's like, names the encoding, it says how big the file is, three pixels by two pixels, and then 255 is saying, I want to use actual full RGB color between 0 and 255, and then you can just start giving, there's comments in the image file, uh, you can start giving the pixels in order, so... This is pure red, pure green, pure blue. There they are, output on this little image on the right. Then yellow, white, black, all that stuff. So that's how you would make an image. And so I have an image for us to work on. It is a picture of my cat when he was a wee lad. Uh, where was that? So it's copied from, let me copy it from last semester. It is a picture of my cat. Uh, so cat.ppm is the name of the file. Let's copy it here. It's giant because it's not compressed, and so it's like 5.1 megabytes, but whatever. So let me log in here on my virtual machine because Windows can't display this kind of file. And this better be able to, otherwise I'm going to have to pause for a second to get it working. Boop, boop. There it goes. So where do I want to be? I would like to be browser. I would like to go to my Windows desktop, F22 code from class, 40, lecture 20, cat.ppm. There it is. Oh man. Okay, I need to figure out what's going to be able to display this. Give me just a second. Let me switch on this computer. That sucks. All right. Uh, it's going to be some image here. Uh, I'm going to default image. Share memes amongst yourself for a second while I figure out how to display this. Where are my lines? 
it used to be. OG. Right. Let's see if that works. Can you watch me debug? Let us pray. Let's see if this actually works. Yeah, there's my cat. Perfect. So here's him laying on my running clothes. Perfect, like reds and blues and stuff. That's why I picked this one. So here's when he was very small, and we're going to read this image and do stuff with it. So here's the image. It's in PPM format. It's giant. P3, this is how many pixels are in the image. Here they all are, and it's 500,000 lines long. So there's a lot of pixels in this image, but that's okay. We're going to process each one of them. So here's what we'll do. We will take this file we will manipulate it and we will convert this image to a grayscale image, okay? So we're gonna make all the pixels equal to each other. 16, 16, 16, 95, 95, 95. That's the closest gray to the color for that current pixel, okay? That's the idea. So here's how you do it. If you would like to convert a color to its closest grayscale color, this is one way to do it. You can just average all the RGB values. So you start with RGB, you compute the average color among all of these. It's between 0 and 255 for each of them. So the average is going to be the R plus the G plus the B over 3. And then you send that pixel to the average three times. That's one way to calculate the closest grayscale value. That's for one definition of closest. Okay? Does that make enough sense? So I'm going to turn all these RGB pixels into their averages three times because that'll make a shade of gray. That's supposed to be the closest shade of gray. All right, so that's what we're going to do. So we're going to read in that file and it should all work out. Um, here, let me make a note for myself in the file when we, uh, when we get there. So I want to call this gray.cpp and just for future reference future lot and install EOG was the name of the program if your VM won't load the image. There. I'm sure I will be thanking my past self. There we go. So yeah, we are going to take in the image file as an IF stream. Why not? IF stream, IFS, let's read in, it's called cat.ppm, it's the name of the image. Oops. And then we're going to write to another file, right? We would like to manipulate this image and call it something else. Let's call it like OF stream, OFS, cat gray .ppm. Okay, so we're going to read from this file, kind of like the copy program. Read all the pixels from this file, write them out, but grayscale to this new one. Okay, so that's the idea. Uh, I just want to manipulate the pixels though, right? So uh, cat.ppm. These first three lines are not pixels. They're just pieces of the image. I want to retain all of those. I want to keep a copy of all these three lines. So I just want to keep those in the output file. So what I'll do is I'll just take them and copy them one by one. And I know that the pixels start after that. So let's just preserve those three original lines because they have to do with the, like the file itself. So let's keep the same first three lines in the output file. Output. Output image. And then, so yeah, let's take those lines one by one. String line, let's just use get line a bunch of times. So get line, IFS into line, and let's output that line into OFS. So I'll do that three times to keep those same three lines. Like, yes, we're using PPM format. Yes, we are now, this is the same sized file. Yes, we are using RGB color. So those three lines, I'm just keeping them, putting them back into OFS. And now, after those three lines, 
I have a bunch of RGB values. First one's red, then, then it's green, then it's blue. That's a pixel. So I'm going to read a bunch of these, okay? And I'm going to manipulate them. So back here we go. So I want to repeatedly, repeatedly read RGB values and modify them. So let's do it. So let's make room. Let's make space for the red part, the green part, and the blue part, R, comma, G, comma, B. I'm going to read them all in right now. So while I can get an RGB value from IFS, so read into red, read into green, read into blue, this will succeed if I just read those three things and it worked out and the file wasn't over, right? Then I would like to convert it to grayscale. Convert to grayscale and add it to the output image. So we've got to make the average, right? There it is, average R plus G plus B over 3. But not like this, you need to use parentheses. There, so that's the average color. And so that's what I want to output as the pixel. I want to output that three times. So that's the new color with spaces in between because that's how it was encoded, right? Don't forget the spaces. So we're going to output now R, or sorry, average, space, average, space, average. And a new line. And it looks like I forgot a little error right here. So that's the new pixel. That's going to be a, a shade of gray. And that's going to go to the output file. And then once I'm done reading pixels and writing other pixels, I'm done with both files. IFS.close, OFS.close. Any questions about that? Does that make enough sense? So, yeah. Um, let's make the file gray.cbp o gray. It's going to open those two files, preserve in the output file the same first three lines. It's going to, oh shoot, did I say C out? Oops, not C out, give it to OFS. There we go. That's a common error to make, that's for sure. There we go. It's going to take a while, I'll explain it. It's got five megabytes to work through. So it, work, it opens the files, it reads the first three lines and it preserves them into the output file. And then it reads a pixel at a time, converts it, writes that pixel. Okay, then it's done with all the files. And so it's a very uncompressed image. It's not the most efficient thing uh, in the world, but it will finish eventually. And then I'll show you the fruits of our labor. It's trying really hard. It'll get there soon enough. But yeah, instead of like, it'll keep the P3, all these lines, and then 255, and then all these lines from here onward, these are the pixel values, we should notice that those end up being all the same in the output file, in the cat gray output file. Okay? And look, it gave me a terminal prompt back, which means it's done. Cat gray.ppm. Here's what it looks like. Here's the difference. Let's. See if I can show you. There's the original. Here's the grayscale version. So here was the average was apparently 23 for the first pixel. Average was apparently 28 for the second pixel. And so these are all grayscale values. Hoo hoo. Here was the original program. And let's take a look. So here is the original cat picture. Here is the grayscale form of that. Look at what we just did. Yay. We did that. So hopefully you have fun with this. You can play around, write your own image uh, modification program, because you can do that now. You can read and write files. So that was my finale for the day. Are there any questions about this program? What it's doing? A little complicated, but I think you can understand it. All right. So yeah, that is, that is files. That's everything that I want to talk to you about files. And let's see. Uh, I don't think I have anything else to say today. Yeah. New lab next time, but it won't be due before the midterm is happening. So not too much to worry about, I would say there. So yeah, that's all I got for today. Let me stop recording.